Hello and welcome to the PartSource Executive Webinar. Today's webinar, Best Practices for Cybersecurity Management of Clinical Technologies, will be presented by Priyanka Upendra, Compliance Program Director at Banner Health. Cybersecurity is such an important topic for health systems, and while PartSource is not in the business of cybersecurity, our advanced logistics and supply chain solutions allow HTM teams and clinical engineering to focus more time on these strategic issues. Because with PartSource, you spend less time sourcing and managing time-consuming logistics and billing of parts and services. And we're very excited to partner with Priya on today's topic. So before we get started, just a few technical notes. Um, first, you have a control panel at the bottom of your screen. You can minimize and expand this panel by hovering over the control bar. And this is how you'll submit questions throughout the presentation. We also have a chat function in case you have any technical difficulties during the webinar. In addition, I want to remind everybody that registrants will receive a uh, link following the meeting, which will have Priya's presentation in it. So in case you missed anything, you'll have an opportunity to view it again as well as share it with your colleagues. So now I'm going to turn the presentation, presentation over to our presenter, Priya Opendra, who is both passionate and knowledge about this topic. Priya, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to friends in the East Coast. Um, thanks to PartSource for giving me an opportunity to talk about this important initiative um, that's very much in scope for the medical device industry and more specifically for the healthcare technology management professionals. To give you an overview of today's session, I'd like to start with a brief introduction of myself, uh, give you an overview of the technology management and the information security departments at Banner Health, uh, followed by some of the goals that we have set forth for both the departments in terms of cybersecurity of clinical technologies as well as expected outcomes. I'll also discuss some activities going on within the department and how we connect with the different IT pillars for managing the cybersecurity of clinical technologies. After discussing the program and operational aspects, uh, we'll move on to looking at what's happening on the regulatory space go over some new and exciting stuff that we have seen developing through the FDA and the Health and Human Services Task Force Groups. Um, to conclude this session, I'll also provide you with some, an overview of the future strategies that we have planned here at the Banner Health Technology Management Department. And since we're all in a space looking for an intelligent tool that will help us automate a lot of the medical device security tasks, I'll just run through a quick success criteria that we have put together for the medical device security platforms that we are evaluating and what we call as the perfect vision or the vision 2020 from an overall program perspective. And I also have some references to share that you can take back and read through. So let's move on and get the session going. Uh, my name is Priyanka Upendra and I go by Priya. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Director of Quality and Compliance for Technology Management Department at Banner Health. Uh, I've been in this role for about nine months and I absolutely love it. Um, it gives me the opportunity to work on exciting uh, cybersecurity topic, but it also helps me stay true to my HTM roots by overseeing the regulatory and compliance activities for our in-house clinical engineering, imaging, and the medical physics team. I have a bachelor's and master's in biomedical engineering and medical electronics, and I'm back to school for a doctorate in healthcare administration. Through the AME Credential Institute, I'm a certified healthcare technology manager, and I'm a certified change management specialist and Six Sigma Lean professional through the, through the Management Strategy Institute. I've been in healthcare for about 12 years, uh, various roles in research and development side, building algorithms for hybrid image reconstruction techniques for PEC CD and PEC CD systems, following which I decided to move to the United States for a graduate degree and pursue a career in HDM. Uh, I started as a biomedical technician at Stanford Children's and worked my way up as an OR clinical engineer and an analyst at Stanford Healthcare, following which I worked as a compliance manager at Intermountain Healthcare and now as a program director at Banner. I'm an active member of the professional organizations in our field and serve at the American College of Clinical Engineering as an executive member, board member as the secretary and the cybersecurity task force lead. 
I'm also a member of the AME Technology Management Council, BINT Editorial Board, Nominating Committee Awards, Equipment Standards Committee, and more recently, the Vocabulary Workgroup Co-Chair. I'm also an active member of HIMSS and the HIS Act through the Medical Device Security Information Sharing Center and the Provider Security Information Sharing Center. Just to give you an overview of Banner Health, uh, Banner Health's mission, vision, and purpose guides us with defining uh, decision making, defining behaviors, and setting standards for our day to day work so we can be a customer focused organization. Our mission is to make healthcare easier so life can be better. This drives reinvention focused on the customer. And we have about six values that define the culture, and these are demonstrated through our actions and behaviors. Some of those are to be customer obsessed, to improve relentlessly, to courageously innovate, to have disciplined focus, to foster accountability, and to continuously earn trust. So Banner operates at about 29 hospitals, a little over 485 clinics, spanning six states, and it's generated about $7.8 billion in revenue from the 2017 financial report. We have donated about $753 million plus in community, uh, community benefits, have an AA bond rating, and employ over 51,000 staff members. We're working at taking access and delivery from complex to easy, from costly to affordable, from unpredictable to reliable, where we give every individual we serve a confidence in their healthcare experience and its outcome. Moving on to the overview of the department I work in. So healthcare technology management, or what we call here as tech management, um, also known as clinical engineering or biomed, we consist of about 253 staff members. That include 206 technicians, engineers, and consultants, 31 management staff members, that's managers, supervisors, directors, senior directors, and a vice president, and about 16 support staff that include the business coordinators, the buyers, and the contract specialists, sales representative for our NTech business, which is a for-profit entity, and an admin assistant. We have our corporate office in Chandler, Arizona, that's southeast of Phoenix, and have shops at all major facilities across the six states. To get into the weeds of things, we take ownership for about 254,000 medical devices and systems that are valued at approximately $1.3 billion. Perry Kerwin is the Vice President of Tech Management. We have about three senior directors that oversee operations in Arizona, the Western region, and the in-tech side of business. We have a medical physics director that oversees medical physics and the radiology quality control technologist and me to oversee the quality and regulatory efforts in addition to the cybersecurity of our systems and devices. I would say the tech management department manages the clinical technology systems cradle to crave, and where we work with construction and planning on design and equipment planning. We have the integrated clinical technologies and the clinical technology assessment and planning group that works with the clinical and business folks to plan and refine the clinical technology needs and manage the integration efforts to the electronic medical record. Our site-based technicians and engineers assist with maintenance implementation, monitoring of our systems, disposal and replacement planning. And then we have the physics team that works closely with radiology, not only to certify and check okay that the systems are safe for use, but they also monitor the doses that's delivered from those imaging modalities. We also have their team working closely with the in-house imaging service engineers that pretty much support all modalities from MRI to ultrasound. We work very closely with our IT partners, and in the true sense, we actually report to the chief information officer who reports to the chief clinical officer, and we are also structured as part of IT. Over the last few years, we have made information security our close friend. The information security department is led by CISO Brian Kissinger, and he has about seven teams reporting up through him. The data protection team that helps identify, document, and implement controls to protect banners data and prevent any unauthorized exposure. The identity and access management team helps develop some strategies and deploy technologies that help centralize access to all of banners' assets. The identity and access identity 
incident management and forensics, they help develop, execute, and manage processes so we can respond, manage, escalate, and report security incidents and breaches in a timely manner. We also work very closely with security architecture that define and document a reference architecture that's aligned with banner strategic objectives and enterprise architecture. I work very closely with that group to actually de uh, define and develop secure configuration profiles for our medical devices. Also working closely with the security governance team or what we call as GRC, that's governance, risk and compliance. That's a group that maintains the risk reduction and management framework and also helps align with all the applicable standards, regulations, and best practices. I work very closely with this team to actually review all of our contracts to make sure that our policies and standards are uh, speaking the same language and also with the overall risk management framework. There's a threat and vulnerability management team that develops and executes processes to better manage vulnerabilities and anomalies found in the information system. That team works very closely with one of the team structured within the tech management group so they can communicate around the vulnerabilities and also remediate those efforts. We also have the security program management office. They help monitor the department and the information security pillar maturity on an ongoing basis. They manage the demand intake process for IS services as well as all remediation activities. They also help deliver security awareness and training and ongoing communication to Banner employees and its partners. So both the departments work very closely on choosing safe and effective technology systems for Banner, deploying secure configurations, making sure we have the right policies and procedures in place, and also the right contractual language to support the needs from a clinical engineering standpoint, as well as the security standpoint. Moving on to discussing what's at risk. While much has been written about the HIPAA security rule implications for health IT and how to address them, I really think that there's very little written about the implications for clinical technology. This absence of material targeted at medical systems and devices affects systems that are three to four folds more than the traditional IT system. And definitely there's more to stake than HIPAA privacy and security rule when we're talking about clinical technologies. We see huge financial losses to the organization, potential loss of meaningful use funds and reputational damage. But more importantly, we're seeing bigger risks that relate to using the medical device as an attack vector or to intentionally disrupt patient care. Think about it, it's one thing for a CT scanner to be down, but what if that CT scanner actually delivered an abnormally high dose of radiation? Another issue is there may be disruptions to the network, which in turn will cause an outage to the clinical technology system that basically rely on the data transmission through the network. This may cause delayed patient testing, increased work backlogs for clinical staff, and in worse situations, patient diversion, or even fatality to patients due to a system malfunction. Public data actually shows that it costs an average of $900,000 in HIPAA fines for each single stolen laptop. And these fines are actually increased if the OCR determines that policies and procedures are inadequate and access is not limited. So really this drills down to how we identify what we have, how we manage what we have through defined and well-structured processes and policies and procedures, and also how we reduce risk to an acceptable level that does not cause disruption of patient care services or systems. Moving on to some goals that we have within the tech management team for cybersecurity management of clinical technologies. We want to be able to proactively identify what we have and manage these risks. We have a process called as clinical technology assessment and planning. This is where our CTAP team, which is comprised of biomedical engineers, uh, clinical engineers, and engineers that have worked on integration projects, nursing folks, as well as some informatics folks. They actually work very closely with clinical, business, supply chain, and IT pillars to drill down into the clinical needs of, of the technology and how those technologies fit into those needs as well as the IT processes, standards, and policies around deployment. 
although the CTAP process is defined, we have, a, we have living, breathing changes that happen within IT and within the clinical side of things. So that makes the entire process of evaluation very dynamic and in some cases very time consuming and also takes up many resources. The second aspect, we want to have the right set of documentation to comply with applicable regulations and also to remediate audit findings. So that really drills down to the activities of the governance risk and compliance group. Third, we also want to have a robust set of training tools and techniques to be able to facilitate education and awareness of cybersecurity of clinical technology. Since I started at Banner, one of my goals has been to educate the tech management staff and information technology staff on cybersecurity of clinical devices. We have routine meetings to discuss the do's and don'ts and along with the IT incident and forensics team and the education team, I'm working on building a Security 101 training module that will basically introduce and socialize the concept of cybersecurity as it pertains to clinical technologies. And that will be made available to all of our staff, our vendors, and other partners. Fourth and most important, we want to be able to integrate cybersecurity into our day-to-day -day business without really causing obstacles in our workflows or causing any frustration to staff. I think that's a very relevant issue and I'm sure many of you face this in your organization. You will be able to embed these practices in the HTM workflows only by socializing the cybersecurity aspect and really getting the staff to understand what happens when you don't follow the right cyber hygiene and also make them ad adapt them to new and refined processes that is far beyond break fix. Through the development and execution of various initiatives and capabilities, we want to improve the overall cybersecurity management of clinical technology and improve the security posture of the enterprise. One, we want to operate within a defined and codified governance structure. These are some of the expected outcomes of the program, where the defined structure actually provides leadership, guidance, accountability, and takes into ownership of the clinical technology security overall across the enterprise. We also want to facilitate and build a partnership and enhance coordination, communication, and collaboration with all partners in the clinical technology ecosystem. That is the clinical folks, the finance, HR, legal, IT, and of course, healthcare technology management. The third is, and the most important, is to be able to move projects in a timely manner and they will deliver them within budget and on time. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're blending cybersecurity into the overall life cycle management of these technologies. We are actually uh, building metrics that uh, showcase the progress of the program or the project and facilitate executive and board level reporting. The fourth aspect is we want to be able to obtain and manage metrics that showcase overall program maturity track progress around established goals, and identify risks to the business, the safety and the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of patients and our care services. The fourth one, we want to oversee the development and implementation of policies, procedures, and standards that actually align with the NIST cybersecurity framework. And at a very minimum, at least at Banner, we review them on an annual basis. The fifth and another important aspect is to manage all communication, collaboration, and integration of cybersecurity awareness and education activities to all banner staff and vendors system-wide. So again, to drill down from the goals and the expected outcomes into the weeds of what tech management really does in terms of cybersecurity management and how it does it, let me review what we have on this slide. So our tech management team through the integrated clinical technologies, CTAP, and the site level technicians, we ensure that systems are functional and reliable during operation. John Pavlicek, he's one of our director of integrated clinical technologies and CTAP, and he and I are the central points of contact with IT, legal, and supply chain when it comes to identifying business needs and deploying of technologies. As it relates to documentation, that's policies, procedures, and metrics showcasing, showcasing measures of success, that is under my portfolio. I'm working on building different scenarios to address the cybersecurity needs 
uh, and cybersecurity of clinical technologies and ensuring we have the right language in our contracts, our agreements, policies and procedures, and all that. We work with our site-level team and ICT teams to ensure that the inventory is accurate. After the banner 2016 breach, that is something that, that we have taken very seriously. We want to know what we have so we can protect it. At this time, we don't have a fancy tool that's basically doing the inventory. We are relying on a, a living, breathing spreadsheet that documents the connected system, the system dependencies, the type of data the system displays, processes, and transmits, the type of access to the servicer as well as the clinician, and the type of application that's running on the medical device, as well as the people that are trained to support it. Uh, I personally think that's a very helpful document, even though it's not something that's automated. Uh, it's available when we need to move towards a remediation effort. Uh, we definitely know what we have, how it connects within the infrastructure, and also who to reach out to when we want to schedule a downtime or even some remediation activities. Another important aspect that I want to discuss is around contracts and service agreements. I work very closely with our contract specialist, the ITGRC team, and legal to review the service agreement, the contracts, and making sure that an inherent risk questionnaire is completed and a full-fledged risk assessment is completed as needed. The inherent risk questionnaire is internally developed by the Banner GRC team, and it contains a variety of questions that addresses the type and the level of connectivity, the type of data access, the logic behind the data access, and the level of data sharing, the cost of services and the overall impact of the services. This actually helps determine the inherent risk score based on which the GRC team recommends the type of security addendum or a data access agreement or a business associates agreement that's needed to support the contract or the service agreement. In some cases, we have time and materials agreements or just a purchasing one where we just complete the IRQ and attach the addendums to those sets. So that basically allows you to cover your organization in terms of any vendor services that you have going. Another initiative that we have underway is to actually review the maintenance practices for each of the device types, compare and contrast those to the patch management strategies, and include them as part of the scheduled maintenance template in our CMMS. This allows us to put a course of time into the scheduled maintenance activities. We're also working with our site-level technicians to make sure that systems are disposed properly and relevant documentation is recorded in the CMMS. We use AIMS as our CMMS, and what we're trying to do is to look at the NIST standards and the DOD standards and look at what are the recommended set of attributes that is needed to be recorded while disposing a system containing EPHI. So we are basically aligning our practices around those recommendations and what the information security team has set as an internal standard. There's also a lot of work underway to make sure that our plans are in working order, and this is very important, and to make sure that the plans are also executable seamlessly. We're working with different stakeholders uh, to identify gaps in the business continuity and disaster recovery plans, and overall, the emergency management plan. Uh, in fact, the end of this month, we also have a tabletop exercise with a variety of stakeholders and that will basically allow us to identify where we have gaps and also refine the plans we have and also to monitor the processes according to the changing threat landscape. Sir, I think we have two questions coming up there. Or do you want to hold the questions towards the end of the session? Yeah, why don't we get through and we'll hold till the end of the session, but we see the questions and we will um, okay. get to them at the end. Thank you, Priya. Sounds good. All right, so basically all of the work that I just went through here is uh, activities within the tech management department. Uh, all of that is done together with our IT pillars. We work with them to develop the programs, to identify and evaluate tools that can support our technologies. Uh, we work very closely with the governance risk and compliance to have the right set of documentation uh, and also with legal and supply chain partners to document the right contractual language. 
Our overall program goal is to align ourselves with the Banner's Information Security Program and work alongside to better manage and reduce the risk due to cybersecurity. We also have a medical device security governance committee that consists of all of the IT pillar leads. This group basically oversees all activities that I discussed so far, and as needed, we also have attendance from the clinical champions and our supply chain partners while we're working through an issue or need specific guidance that's relevant to their side of things. So that was, I believe that's a lot of activities to discuss, but let me move over to some more exciting stuff and talk about what's happening on the regulatory side. So according to the FDA that's responsible for regulating medical devices, we have three classes, the class one, class two, and class three, and each of those where a particular type of pre-market submission or an approval or a notification is required. So back in 2014, what the FDA did was release a guidance document on pre-market submissions addressing these cybersecurity concerns. And over the following years, what we have seen is development of post-market guidance as well as the refining of the pre-market guidance that basically gives us a lot more direction around best practice and the processes. What I think is, though we have the language to report adverse events, we aren't doing a good job with reporting events related to cybersecurity of the clinical systems. If you look at the MOD database and try to extract events reported around cybersecurity, you really find close to none. However, FDA has supported these efforts tremendously. They've addressed concerns of the clinical system and how, what kind of risk they present through their safety communications. I'm not sure how many of you have actually read through those. Uh, they work with the manufacturers and the researchers to identify risks, uh, exploitable vulnerabilities, and ways to address them. This, is, this information is then relayed to the users through their safety communication. This landscape of collaboration is improving and has definitely improved over the last few years through a number of workshops, discussion sessions, and inputs from multiple stakeholders. To kind of just overview what that 510K document is, uh, that's just a detailed submission list that provides assessments, risk information, and test results. And although these guidance documents are not really um, legally binding, it's important to know that these are provided based on existing regulations and that medical device manufacturers must follow them. And according to the pre-market as well as the post-market guidance of, for management of cybersecurity in medical devices, manufacturers need to report a cybersecurity fix to either an ISO or uh, via the 21 CFR 806 reporting if they determine that the cybersecurity fix actually modifies the function of the device. But if the cybersecurity fix or an update does not modify the function or the labeling of the device, then those are just considered as device enhancements and they don't need to go through the full uh, approval, pre-market approval or the notification process. So I would basically recommend the audience to actually read the cybersecurity fact sheet that's on the website and I've listed that URL there that basically clarifies a lot of myths and delivers facts. Uh, I think these are very much applicable to us when we're uh, dealing with updates and patches for cyber reasons. I just kind of put a red box over some that uh, I've had to deal with when medical devices or medical device manufacturers don't give us an update or state FDA approval process as a reason for their, um, you know, for them taking a lot of time with validating and verifying the patch. Moving on to some of the things that um, came out of the 2018 October pre-market guidance document for cybersecurity submission. Um, so there was a workshop held in Maryland in January this year, uh, and there were some interesting things that the document recommends and uh, a lot of things that were discussed. And I've just put together a set of pros and cons, which are, what I think are my opinion, uh, but I would recommend to everyone to read the 2018 October pre-market guidance for cybersecurity submissions document, and also provide their feedback during the public comment period that is ending on March 18th. So the 2018 October guidance document discussed the software or the cybersecurity bill of materials, called as the F-bomb or the C-bomb. Um, Pro, I think it's a wonderful uh, uh, way to mandate that for the manufacturers to deliver to the users of the devices. 
It allows for transparency in terms of what software components have gone into building that medical device. Um, and that is actually a very detailed document. At this time, one of the cons, what I think, is that the health systems are not staffed appropriately, nor do we have the resources on how to consume the information outlined in the SBOM or the CBOM document. So really, we need more guidance from the FDA or another task group to, on how to effectively acquire as well as consume the information and how that communication is going to happen with the manufacturers and the users of device if the health system identifies any vulnerabilities through the bill of materials. The second aspect, and which I thought was very interesting, was the third categorization of the medical devices outlined in the 2018 October document. Um, I think there are two cons to this. One, uh, we don't have any history behind why the tiered categorization of this risk was introduced, and there is no documentation on how it relates to the standard cybersecurity risk uh, that we're discussing, nor any alignment with the CMS and Joint Commission uh, criteria for defining risk as per the environment of care factors. Uh, another aspect what I think is a con is that the scope is too broad, uh, there is a lack of detail around the system dependencies of these devices um, and also how the devices work uh, within that healthcare setting. There's no mention of any factors that may be introduced through the infrastructure uh, uh, dependencies. Another interesting aspect that was uh, discussed during this workshop was around designing uh, medical devices to auto-update security patches. I think that is an awesome initiative, and in the true sense, that would actually allow a very timely and rapid uh, verification and validation patch of the uh, validation of the patch of the medical device. Uh, but I think there is no not much detail around what the delivery method would be for releasing those patches, or the added cost to the device or to the health system around those patches or even the auto-update window of the patch, uh, those are some of the aspects that are still unknown. Um, just to give a little more information on what the American College of Clinical Engineering is doing around this, is uh, we've put together a task force that has reviewed the document and put an initial um, uh, written comment together on behalf of the ACC. Uh, I think that should be available on the ACC website sometime next week. Uh, what I would suggest to the audience is to review and add uh, or comment to that, um, you know, ACC commentary. That way we can submit that to the FDA as the voice of the HDM community. Another interesting thing that's actually coming up through um, the FDA, the HHS, and others in this ecosystem is the SIMSAP, or what they call as the CyberMed Safety Expert Analysis Board. Um, the, uh, this is nothing but a private-public partnership where you have experts from the manufacturer, the researcher community, the HDO, as well as the regulatory community that are basically going to assess what the risks and vulnerabilities are. They're going to investigate those and also help health systems with investigating any um, security breaches because of medical devices. Um, I just listed out some pros and cons because I was in that workshop and we had a few breakout discussions around the SIMSAP activities. Uh, I think it's a great set of resources to have and enforced from a regulatory perspective and also to expand um, the public-private partnerships and to deliver some practices to the pre-market and the post-market stakeholders. Um, but however, at this time, the cons is that there is a lack of strong vision at this time. Uh, there's also a lot, lack, uh, lot of activities of the SIMSAP that's overlapping with what the search does. Search is the cyber emergency response team, or what the uh, HISAC does. So we need some more clarification on what are the specific activities of the SIMSAP uh, and its members, and how the researchers and manufacturers and HDOs are going to communicate within each other or to each other through the SIMSAP. Uh, there's also a lack of uh, definition with preemptive and proactive role. Uh, in incident response. Are those services available free of cost to the health systems and the manufacturers? Or is that something they have to pay for the SIMSAP activities? Um, that is not defined in the action plan. So there was a discussion about refining those documents to um, you know, clarify all these uh, different uh, questions. So 
So I recommend to the audience to read the 2018 April Medical Device Safety Action Plan. I think it's an interesting document that basically gives you an idea of what's happening in the regulatory space and basically how that would impact the long-term planning in your organization. Apart from all that's happening in the regulatory side, um, there's also another interesting document that was re uh, released in December of 2018. Uh, that's called as the HICCUP, or it's the Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Practices. Uh, it's a four series um, document that actually talks about uh, uh, what the industry standards should be. Again, this is not a standard or a regulation. It's just a set of uh, 200, 250 people that have got together through the HHS uh, 405D task force and they've uh, taken into account 10 specific areas within a cyber program and have suggested recommendations to what the health system should do. So number nine in this set of documents is medical device security uh, that talks about a lot about implementation of technologies and how to manage them and how to manage the sensitive data that's handled in the devices. So I would recommend the audience to read through that. There are also tons of opportunities for the HTM folks to get involved, and I've listed a few on this slide. Um, I've been a part of these uh, different societies and groups, and what I have noticed is that there's a lack of presence from the HTM groups, and in specific, the in-house HTM programs. Uh, there are a lot of workshops through HISAC, which is Healthcare Information Security and Analysis Center. Uh, through ACC, there are a lot of webinars, there are a lot of workshops, task forces through AMI. Um, there are workshops through FDA, Advermed, HIMSS, AHIS, and CHIME. Uh, a lot of the IT folks are involved with Advermed, HIMSS, AHIS, and CHIME. Um, and I don't see a lot of presence with healthcare technology management or the biomed. So I would really suggest the audience to talk among your organizations, get involved, and put your voice forth. Uh, work internally to also pull in support from your stakeholders, that's legal, supply chain compliance, quality, and also public relations. And all this not only when you're in a crisis mode, but also when you're just planning your processes and you're refining your policies to include um, the cybersecurity aspects. And in addition to that, just build relationships with your peers, uh, with the different security vendors and others in this uh, ecosystem. Uh, that way, you're learning what the other organizations are doing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, a lot of organizations, Mayo, Intermountain, um, you know, Stanford, they've all done a lot of good work, and you can basically take what you've done and you know tailor that to meet your organization's needs. I hope all of that was actually informational and useful for you to take part and uh, implement in your organization. So just to kind of summarize what I discussed is happening in Banner, and to also give you a brief overview of some of the things that we have planned for us. Uh, we are actually doing uh, proof of concept testing with two vendors at this time at four of our locations. Um, those four locations are small, medium, and large size care centers and one corporate location. We actually had about five vendors that we evaluated and drilled down to two for the POC. Uh, we're also working on uh, uh, you know, completing the proof of concept testing and moving to make a decision for a full-scale deployment of a technology. Um, so all the zinc box, the cloud post, or order and assemblies and Medigate. So those are all the vendors that we're looking at for the POCs. Um, and also just this entire evaluation process. Uh, another act um, uh, action item that's happening is to streamline all the policies and procedures. Uh, and align the language with the information security policies and standards. Um, so we kind, of, we kind of did an, a gap analysis last year to identify what we have and what language is missing from our documentation. And this year we're working on including all of that documentation. Um, this will also help us build metrics uh, along with the POC and what we see on the network. A lot of those activities automated. Uh, we're trying to generate some meaningful reports and at a very minimum just look at how many risk assessments are completed, how many secure configurations are developed or how many are deployed, and also the number of patches available on a 30, 60, 90 day basis, how many have been deployed and even the number of events or incidents we see related to cybersecurity. A few more activities that's happening is uh, we're reviewing the maintenance strategies as part of our AEM program, 
but we're also looking at where we can embed the cybersecurity related activities in the PM templates. Um, this is a big time consuming effort and definitely will need a lot of resources, especially for an organization as large as Banner. Um, so that is an effort that's happening, but at a very slow pace. Uh, we're also, um, you know, uh, tasked with managing some exceptions to uh, internal security standards and IS best practices. And for the first time, tech management folks are actually involved with reviewing the standards information security has put together and how that impacts the clinical technology workflows and how we can embed activities that are relevant to managing these clinical technologies. Uh, we're also uh, hoping to use the data from the proof of concepts as well as the full-scale implementation that we hope to get into by the end of this year to basically identify baseline behaviors of the devices and monitor abnormal data flows and just document them in our CMMS or in ServiceNow. We're also going to uh, look at the next flow of the data and the different communication patterns, uh, which I think will really help with the micro-segmentation efforts and also to apply appropriate uh, access control lists. Uh, in addition to that, um, tech management working very closely with legal compliance and information security on creating training and awareness documents and also making sure that we have some computer-based training modules or CBT modules available for all banner employees and the vendors. Um, just so you know, we're all looking at some medical device security platforms, and I just wanted to share what we have as some of the success criteria. Um, and I think I've outlined about seven points here is one, we want to make sure that the platform allows us with almost real-time device identification and profiling, that is it records all the IT attributes and the network parameters that are necessary to basically profile a device. Uh, we're identifying um, standard and non-standard behavior on the network that will basically help us to identify if there are abnormal communications happening outside of your network or to external sites. You also want your tool to be able to map network topologies for the devices and also to organize that dynamically. That will help with your ne network segmentation efforts. Um, the other effort, if you're as integrated as Banner uh, with Palo Alto Networks or with any of the, your firewall management, um, your tool or the security tool should be able to define and apply policies based on the behavior patterns of the devices. Uh, another important aspect what I think should the, pla uh, the platform should have is to be able to identify uh, vulnerabilities that could be exploitable and also to generate actionable work orders for your CMMS or for your ServiceNow platform, that way the HTM and IT staff can work from it. Uh, another important strategy, and I think a lot of platforms are developing that, is to identify the device utilization. Um, so from the different packet transfers that's happening, they are able to look at how many number of images have been transferred or what time the devices or the systems are heavily used or just the frequency of use of the system. That way you can actually plan your maintenance strategies that includes AEM and also your downtime windows. In addition to all of these, I think all these platforms have uh, uh, you know, the ability to generate awesome reports, uh, very meaningful reports that showcase the program maturity and the security posture of your devices. So just to kind of summarize everything that I talked about uh, during this session, uh, we've put together something we call as the Vision 2020 or the Perfect Vision. And since we have a lot of HTM folks on the uh, uh, in the presentation, I was I just kind of put this: think of medical device cybersecurity or cybersecurity of clinical technologies as leakage and grounding standards. So leakage, what we have is the security hole that needs identification and remediation, and grounding is basically to develop and sustain a process that will protect the safety and reliability of medical devices and clinical technologies and basically send attackers to a quarantine net. So again, four important aspects, engage your HTM team um, and create a sense of ownership and accountability within. Uh, uh, build a culture that will educate, train and spread awareness around uh, the risk of connected clinical technologies. Obtain your executive leadership support and get resources to drive this work. At the same time, make sure you have a clinical champion that oversees what decisions you're making as part of the cybersecurity 
for these clinical technologies because ultimately it's them that's going to be impacted with any changes in workflows and also work on transforming your process. I don't think we can remain in a state of break fix mindset anymore. Uh, we are using state of the art technologies. So having processes that are relevant, streamlining operations across the life cycle of the device, that's very important. So it's really a high time to evaluate your policies, procedures, and processes and make sure that it's aligned with um, documents that others have in this medical device ecosystem. Um, uh, these are credits to Bill Hagestad. He's a good friend and uh, a cybersecurity expert. He's with Medtronic in Minneapolis now. Um, so he's, I've just been adding some references to this document that he originally put together. So just a set of uh, references from the government and the Information Security Engineering Group. And you also have the AME Medical Device Cybersecurity Guide. Um, a lot of work has gone into this guide as well, so please purchase that and make use of um, uh, things outlined. There are also templates for policies and procedures, as well as, as well as a lot of guidance around what processes you need to build. Um, so make use of what's available in the industry. And uh, that's it from now, and um, thank you. Thanks for this opportunity, and I think we have about uh, 13 minutes for some Q&A. Perfect, Priya. Thank you so much. So helpful, especially um, on this very important topic. So at this time, you if you haven't submitted questions yet, you can go to your control panel and type them in. And we do have some questions that came in throughout the presentation. And we encourage you to ask our expert here, Priya, anything that may be on your mind related to cybersecurity. So our first question, Priya, says, can you please list the four types of security addendum? You mentioned data access agreement as one of them. Yes. Um, so we have, um, actually we have four types of security addendums based on the four risk levels that are generated from the inherent risk questionnaire that we have. So we have uh, one addendum for any low inherent risk. We have the second addendum for the moderate inherent risk. And the third and fourth is for any inherent risk that are high and critical rated. So the process that we have is if it's, uh, we complete the IRQ and that is along with the vendor as well as the users of our devices. And if the risk comes down to a low or a moderate level, we define some recommendations and uh, get a consensus from the business owner and the vendor around those and attach the addendum A or B to the contract or the service agreement that we have. If it is a high or a critical risk score, we are actually collaborating with Prevalent to do a full-fledged risk assessment. And then um, they actually drill down into the weeds of the services and the different access levels and such. And that's when the addendum uh, C or D goes into attachment for the contract or the service agreement. Um, I will actually, let me run through with our uh, GRC team. And if they're happy to just kind of uh, remove the specifics of the organization and share the risk questionnaire, I'm happy to provide that. But I think uh, with respect to the security addendum, um, you need to work with your legal and also your IT and just check with them on what they have. Because for a lot of software services, they have different types of addendums. And uh, with a lot of clinical technologies being software controlled at the moment, um, you can basically reuse what they have by just tweaking some language as applicable to your uh, medical devices. Perfect, thank you, Priya. We have another question. What do you do with legacy technology where patching may not be fully available? Oh, that, that is, uh, we are actually working with the vendors as well as the users if there is an option to replace that technology. Uh, in cases where we cannot replace, uh, we're documenting exception requests and looking at any compensating controls we have or we can put in place. Um, ultimately, it falls down to the organization as well as the users of the device on assuming the liability that, you know, the risk from those devices can present and also uh, any vulnerabilities you have, not all of them can be exploitable. Let's say if you have a vulnerability that um, can be exploited only by physical access and if you have that device in a very physically controlled environment like an OR where, you know, physical access is limited, you can actually document that and you know you can bring down that inherent risk to a lower level. 
So make sure that you're actually doing that risk analysis to identify what legacy systems you have, what vulnerabilities have been discovered, what's exploitable, and basically looking at the likelihood of uh, occurrence and also the severity if that occurrence were to happen. Great, thank you, Priya. We have another question. As for labeling devices in regards to cybersecurity, what kind of details might you find on these labels? And do they vary from manufacturer to manufacturer? FDA pre-market guidance speaks to some of this, CBOM type info, but that's future. What's there now? I think the CVSS type and such has not been put on any label so far, I haven't seen. But however, there are a lot of manufacturers that are also members of the FDA and HHS task group and HISAC active members that have been really nice about communicating um, the labeling requirements of their devices or if there are any changes because of cybersecurity reasons. So Philips, Siemens, or the GEs and some um, Smith Medical or you know or Medtronic, they've really been good about um, you know keeping up with the changes that FDA is suggesting. But I think what uh, a lot of these cybersecurity activities that you see coming up as recommendations in the 2018 October pre-market guidance document, or even the 2016 um, or the 2017 January post-market guidance document, that is something that's going to happen in the future. If you're purchasing a device probably this year or next year, you can see a lot of those aspects coming up. But at this time, I don't see a lot of those documents under the label requ labeling requirements. Another question here. Can you speak in a bit more detail about how your organization goes about assessing connectivity and the inherent risk or lack thereof with a specific medical device from a vendor? Okay. So the, um, let me see if I can actually share that document or not, or probably I can, I can you know, run through and then share it. Uh, so the risk questionnaire that we have with the level of connectivity, we're looking at whether the vendor has direct access to our system, access to a VPN um, uh, system where you have the vendor account monitored by banner, or do they have access on an on-demand basis only, or is it an access that generated by a banner employee and then having the um, you know vendor uh, uh, work alongside. So any access that is direct or any uh, access to a VPN which may or may not be controlled, those will automatically put the vendor in a high-risk basis. In terms of data, the amount of data shared, or the volume of records, are you sharing any PHI records? If yes, what is the volume of that? That determines the risk level as well. Uh, the patient safety impact, if that device or system were to be uh, were to malfunction, or if the access were to be um, unauthorized, or if any data was, um, any integrity of data was affected, what kind of impact are you seeing? That is a deciding factor as well. In addition to that, we have what we've defined as logical or illogical access types. Uh, I don't remember the definition on the top of my head, but I'll be happy to um, you know, give you that information if you reach out to me at a separate time. Um, that determines the level of uh, inherent score as well. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a, a, a tab in that risk questionnaire that talks about the cost of expenses on an annual basis. So if you have a, you know, a, a million dollar uh, a revenue generating system and then you have all these high risks, that is something to think about as well. Um, so you have a number of uh, factors going into determining the inherent risk score. Great. Thank you, Priya. We have time for just a few more questions before we wrap up. Um, training of teams. How do you recommend getting HTM teams trained and keeping them trained on cybersecurity issues? Uh, thanks for that. That is a very relevant topic. Um, at first, when I started talking about cybersecurity training for the HTM folks, um, I, I, I didn't get good faces. I honestly had people frowning at me because this is something that you're adding on top of the number of staff that they already have. Uh, you know, the workload is definitely a lot for the HTM folks. So um, uh, what we did as training was create like a security 101 uh, document, and that, that is still developing. We've just done a basic start to that but just introduce what the IT security process looks like from start to finish. 
or what the IT intake process looks like. So if you're bringing in new devices to the organization, what does the IT process look like? And having that um, uh, you know, process familiarized in the HTM side is very important because at this time, we put in random requests with IT uh, as and when we have a device in our shop. So basically understanding that they have a structured, defined process that helps working in a proactive manner. Or in, um, in terms of contract, I, I'm sure you have a ton of uh, service agreements or time and materials agreements coming up for renewal. And IT GRC definitely has a process in place. They have an eight to 12 week um, period to actually review the technologies or the contracts and also to review what risks they present to the organization. So what we've done in tech management is to actually uh, get notifications from our contract management tool at least um, every 30, 60, 90, and 180 days in advance. So depending on the, we do the initial IRQ uh, questionnaire, and then depending on the risk level, we're actually trying to work at least 12 weeks in advance so we can work with the vendor, get all of their responses on the questionnaire, as well as if it falls under a high or a critical rating, then we need to engage Privilege, which is another third party, to do a full risk assessment. So that back and forth takes a lot of time. Um, so we're basically trying to include all of that in our education documents. And we have monthly all leaders meeting where we give updates. Uh, that runs for almost an entire day. So we are trying to do at least half an hour or one hour of education, at least for the leaders. And what I have in plan is to visit all the sites uh, uh, throughout the year along with my IT counterparts and actually have a full day or at least half day education session. In addition to all this, we are also um, working on conducting some tabletop exercises to review the incident response and um, disaster recovery and business continuity plans that we have in place. And what we're trying to do is just identify how people respond to these events and incidents uh, document, um, um, you know, where we need to improve and actually make those improvements and then do an exercise again. So uh, doing those at least on a biannual basis really helps. Uh, and that is something that I would recommend for all organizations because you will have people sitting there with blank faces. They may have been in the job for 10, 20, 30 years, but really not know how to respond, um, um, you know, to an, during an incident much beyond um, you know, getting the HICS activated. So how they get involved with the hospital incident command centers and how they are actively engaged and how they're providing timely updates to the executive and the board, um, that is something that you will really learn during these tabletop exercises. Thank you, Priya. We are actually at our time today. Um, Priya, I want to thank you so much for your invaluable insight, as always. Um, thank you so much. And as a reminder, all registrants will receive a follow-up email with a link to today's webinar so that you can review it or share it. And also, don't forget to register for our upcoming asset planning webinar featuring, featuring expert Carol Davis-Smith. And you can register for that webinar by visiting the news and events section of partsource.com. Again, thank you all for attending our Part Source Executive webinar today. And Priya, thank you so much. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you so thank much. You. Have a great afternoon, everyone.